The Retirement Cafe podcast, episode 35, What Makes a Successful Investment Strategy in Retirement with David Jones of Dimensional Fund Advisors. Retired or thinking about retirement? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Retirement Cafe podcast. In each episode, we bring you an important conversation with insight, tips and knowledge, all designed to help you live a fulfilling and successful life in retirement. Here's your host, Chartered Financial Planner and Accredited Later Life Advisor, Justin King. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast. This week, I'm delighted to share the second part of my conversation with David Jones of Dimensional Fund Advisors. And if you missed the first part of our conversation, you can head to the retirementcafe.co.uk and search for episode 34 or on your podcast, a player of choice. It's titled Academically Proven Approach to Investing. I really enjoyed where our conversation was headed and David has just turned 60. So I asked him what the future holds for him. But before getting on to David's personal life, I started by asking, how do you as a fund manager implement and how does a retiree implement a successful investment strategy? So here's my chat with David Jones of Dimensional Fund Advisors. If you think about, you know, what does it take to have a successful investing experience? I mean, that's essentially what, what, what people want to have. And, and I think it starts actually with clarifying what, what the goals are. What are your outcomes? Uh, because then that can tell you a lot about how you should invest your money. And so if, if you get your, your goals clarified and you, you kind of have an understanding of the rate of return that you need in order to, to deliver on that, and for that rate of return to be realistic. Uh, if, if you sit down with somebody and say, well, we've, we've done your financial plan and we've calculated that you're gonna need a 20% return on your investments in order to achieve your, your goals, there you go, you, no, you have to go back and, yeah. and really look at your, your expectations as to, to what's re- realistic and educate them as, as to, you know, what, what are the rates of return that you can expect on whether it's, it's global equities or global bonds whatever is going to be in, in the asset allocation. So that's the starting point. And then it's really understanding, okay, for the asset allocation, what are the, what is the characteristics of the different assets that you're going to be putting into the, into the plan? So equity is likely to be the, the driver of, of the returns in the plan, but not everybody has the capacity or the, the, the risk tolerance to take 100% equity portfolio, and that wouldn't necessarily be appropriate. So you're going to design the portfolio to deliver the long-term objectives of the portfolio, which is likely to be driven by more equity uh, investment, with the shorter term needs for liquidity uh, or volatility dampening that allows them to stay in their seat when things get a, uh, get a bit rough, uh, you know, and the seas sort of uh, coming over the bows of the boat. Mm. So I think it's it's important to to, to have that that understanding, and then if if you get the the goals right, so you you know you, you're benchmarking to your own goals, you understand the nature of the investments that that you're putting into your portfolio, then the key is to stay disciplined. You know, actually staying on track, understanding that you know if if markets are volatile, that's what you expected ahead of time. Yeah. So stay in your seat, and then tune out the noise. Because we know that there are millions of potential sources of information that people have about their investing and their future lives, whether whether that's from you know the mainstream media or social media, or the brother-in-law or the, the notorious bloke in the pub yep. who has some view on how people should invest. It's actually can you tune that out to say no, I I I, I have my plan. I have my, my portfolio, it's designed to do this, I've benchmarked it against my own needs, not against other people's needs. And uh, generally speaking, uh, then those needs are best served by a really good advisor right. because they're going to take all that heavy lifting away. They're, they're going to help you clarify your goals. They're going to put in place an appropriate asset allocation. They're going to help you stay disciplined when everything around them is, is, is screaming do something different. Uh, don't just don't just stand there. Do something. Uh, but actually, it should be the other way round. Don't just do something. Stand there, and and tune out all, all this 
it's other noise. So I think then to come back to the, the original part of your question, which was around, well, how, how should a, a, a fund manager implement, how, how should we implement, is we want to make sure that what we're doing in, in putting financial science to work in portfolios is that we'll be really careful that these, that these are going to behave in the way that you expected them to behave. So are we, are we doing something very different to what we said that, w- that we would do? No, you want to see us delivering uh, the outcomes in a very consistent way, that we're, we're managing uh, uh, people's money in, in, in appropriately. Now, some of these things are very simple to say. Of course, we're, we're going out into markets and we're, we're buying stocks based on the, um, the criteria that we need for each of these different portfolios. Under the surface, a huge amount of work goes on to make sure that, that we're identifying the, the right stocks to buy, what, you know, how, how we build the portfolios. Uh, on any given day, there, there's going to be all sorts of different corporate actions, all sorts of different uh, things will happen in the market. Uh, something new will happen that will move market prices today. There's going to be requirements for liquidity for all, all of these things. And so if, if you could see the amount of like millions of pieces of data that we are handling on a daily basis in order for us to be managing portfolios that in some cases will have upwards of 12,000 individual securities in them, you start to realize that it becomes actually uh, very complex and yeah. so at, at, at dimensional you know we invest very heavily in the technology that we need in order to be able to uh, manage highly diversified portfolios at a reasonable cost because if you didn't control costs that would have a have a huge impact on, on people's outcomes so we're we're constantly managing uh, trade-offs we're constantly ma- you know managing trying to identify you know the that that systematically the securities with the higher expected returns, with the diversification that we need in the portfolio, with the prices that we're observing in the market on any given day. So this is, if you can imagine a five-dimensional chess game, which you probably can't because we can't really imagine things beyond three dimensions, but that's essentially what's going on, these, this multidimensional, multi-layered uh, approach to um, delivering uh, returns. So I think it's helpful you know, to just see, well, 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 what lenses are we actually applying to a market on any, any given day? And, and just to simplify it a, a little bit for the listeners, you know, we're, we're looking at things through a long-term lens, short-term lens, and a daily lens or an intraday lens. So big picture, yes, we're identifying securities based on market capitalization or value securities or securities with higher uh, direct profitability, uh, on, a, on a shorter term basis, we know that there are other effects that we can observe, through, for example, through securities lending or momentum, the, 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 you know, the tendency for stocks that are rising quickly in value to keep going in that direction for a short period of time or, right. or securities that are plummeting in value to keep plummeting for right. a short period of time. So you want to make sure that when you're, you're managing uh, portfolios that you're you're taking advantage of that that information that, that is being presented to you by the market, but then on a daily basis and actually intraday, yeah. so things that are happening during the trading day, that we're we're setting up our systems and processes appropriately to make sure that we can take a, advantage of those movements that are happening uh, on a on a daily basis in the market. So if, if we were walk, to walk about 50 yards down the corridor uh, to where the traders are, are working right now, you'd be able to see actually what's going on um, as they're managing thousands of stocks uh, in, in portfolios. It's, you know, technology is doing a lot of the heavy lifting, but th- they're sort of keeping an eye on and everything that, that, that is happening because we want to make sure that we're trading as efficiently as we can on a, on a daily basis because we don't want to give, give up uh, costs because that has an impact it on clients' returns. Clients returns, absolutely. Yeah. So one thing that is quite unique about Dimensional is that you're not, you're not open to the 
I don't think you are, anyway, to the kind of the retail market. I mean, someone can't phone up Dimensional and buy one of your funds. Correct. You know, they, they, they can only access them through well, people like myself, etc. Tell me about that relationship. Why, why, how's that come about? Well, originally, when Dimensional started in 1981, with the idea, the, the first fund was, was a, a small company fund in the, in the US, it was an institutional manager. So our, our clients were large institutions. And, and when you work with large institutions, you're de dealing with professional investors and they understand. So that like be a university or a, or a state? Or yeah, it could be a university endowment. It could be a large company's pension fund. And, and so they understand you know, what, what, what we're trying to do. But they also understood that, that this was long term yeah. buy, and, buy and hold investments. And they appreciated what Dimensional was trying to do, which was something very different uh, from, from other, other asset managers. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's that conversation that we're able to enter into with people to, so that they understand really what, what, what we're trying to do. And it, it, this engagement is not a sort of a very short term transactional Engagement and so, when back in the in the nineteen late nineteen eighties, uh, an advisor in the U.S., a guy called Dan Wheeler, wanted to start using dimensional funds for his clients, yeah. who would be classified as as retail clients. Dimensional was was at first reticent because they're saying, well, actually, we 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 don't kind of don't want this in inverted commas ill-disciplined kind of retail investor behavior or the you know the sort of Sw sw swapping it and out. Because they'll jump in, jump, jump, out, out. jump out, and, and that'll stuff up your investment problem. Investment yeah, philosophy, I mean, it, I well, it's it's you know it, it could hurt the, hurt the returns of the funds. So it would be difficult. Should, yeah. As a manager, you're running money. You're trying to run money for a long term process, and then if you've got someone who wants to buy this week and sell next week, that that, yeah. that causes a yeah, an issue. it ca ca causes an issue. I mean, uh, you, you know, in the, in a lot of. Uh, you know, let's say you're a you're a portfolio manager and you've you come into work one day and you've got lots of great ideas that you want to put to work and there's been some wobble in the markets and 20% of your investors have phoned up and want to redeem because there's been you know some wobble. So suddenly you might have to sell all those buy to let portfolios that you'd bought, not that you do, but in essence for the yeah. for the for the for the story. Yeah. But you've had to sell all those properties you bought yeah. the previous week. And no one would want to do that. It, it, exactly right. And so, uh, actually, you know, you're forcing liquidity when, yeah. you know, liquidity yeah. is I I expensive. So for, for Dimensional, in working with initially uh, this first uh, financial advisor and, and then recognising that he, he was one of this burgeoning uh, community of advisors who wanted to do something very different for their clients, uh, work in a very different way, you know, typically shifting to away from that old sort of brokerage commission world into this financial planning, holistic uh, provision of advice, typically on a, on a fee basis uh, and dimensional and this sort of growing movement of financial planners sort of came together in a very sort of happy Happy Alliance, and and that was really the start of uh, of Dimensional sort of second phase after this initial phase where it was just an institutional right. manager, started developing these relationships with financial advisors, which has become the the biggest part of our business globally. So I, I think f uh, for Dimensional, we we have always sort of recognised that clients who are well advised generally will have a higher probability of a successful investing outcome than clients who are, who are not advised or badly advised, let's, sure. let's face it. And, um, and so we've, we've always had this, this view of, of supporting uh, the financial advisor uh, community with, you know, typically with starting with education. Um, uh, we've uh, invested a lot of resources in helping advisors really understand the work that, that we've done, the, the academics that we're associated with, that, that they've done in understanding how, how markets work and how you can systematically identify uh, investments with higher expected returns and, and build these into portfolios that are going to have meaningful outcomes for clients. And so we, we've invested huge resources in, in, into that and we think that we, we will continue to do so into the future. How would um, 
How would someone who's listening to us who, you know, maybe not got an advisor or has got an advisor, how, how would they find out, how would they find an advisor who could access Dimensional? If they contact Dimensional, so if we would put them in touch with advisors in their local area right. who, the, who we know, and we, we don't endorse them, you know, sure. they have to do their own due diligence on those those advisors, but we have a find an advisor okay. uh, process. Right. If, if people want to know more about uh, Dimensional, they can go to Dimensional dot com and navigate to the to the blog section of our website and you'll know, see lots of interesting discussions about investment matters there so mm, right there's lots of information available uh, to them well, we'll put that in the show notes and um so just on a personal level i know that you know you turned 60 last week so happy birthday i did well thank you very much <laughs> Um, Don't feel a day over 59. <laughs> and so, you know, a lot of the people who are listening to this are actually approaching or in retirement. You know, mm-hmm. so tell me about what you picture your retirement to be like. That's, that's a I'm not committing a great you to a date, by the way. So you're well, a, the, the, I think <laughs> the first thing to, to think about it is, you know, I've done quite a lot of thinking about this. Mm. Uh, and I'm quite attracted to this, uh, this Japanese idea of... Uh, of it's called kanreiki. Kanreiki is uh, when you're 60 in Japan, you, you, the, the birthday is called kanreiki. Right. And it essentially is the completion of, of one complete cycle of the, of the zodiac. You, you've lived a complete cycle and the next cycle starts. Uh, essentially, it's, a, it's a, an opportunity for rebirth. And I was very attracted to, to, that, to that idea. And when I compared it, so this idea of rebirth to retirement uh, and the operative verb in retire is withdraw. And I, and I thought, actually, no, I, uh, I'm not interested in a withdrawal. Uh, I'm much more interested in this, this idea of a, of a rebirth. So I looked up, uh, it was Dr. Martin Seligman, who's, who's one of the uh, professors who's done a lot of work on positive psychology. You know, what was a, a definition of, of happiness? And it combined these three things, enjoyment, engagement and meaning. So a life that combines enjoyment, engagement and meaning kind of adds up to a, sort mm. of a, a happier, more fulfilled life. So for me, retirement isn't about withdrawing. It's about exploring ways into, to have enjoyment, engagement and, and meaning. Uh, well, one of the ways that you can do that, there's no requirement on me to stop doing what I'm doing, which is great because I love doing what I'm doing. And it I think helping people have better outcomes in their investing lives is a way to, to have meaning in life. Um, and engaging with people, whether it's colleagues here or it's advisors that we work with, is, is actually uh, an incredibly fulfilling way uh, to live a life. So then it brings us to the enjoyment part. And for me, that's being as, as physically active as, uh, as I can possibly be. So I, I still compete uh, in rowing, I'm a very keen cyclist, and um, uh, trying to stay as physically active as I can. And, and I think for a lot of people coming up to retirement now, I think our expectations are, are very different from maybe our parents' generation, which sort of is this slide into inactivity. Uh, and I think we, we think very differently now that we, we think that if we can maintain physical fitness and uh, you know, look after our diet, look after our, uh, sort of our, our bodies, that actually there's no reason why into our 80s or 90s we wouldn't just as, as be as active as we, we possibly could be. So for me, it's, it's doing all of those things to, yeah. to, to, to have an enjoyable uh, life, not a life of withdrawal. Absolutely, wise mm. words, wise words. Thank you so much, David, for joining me today on the uh, Retirement Cafe podcast. I mean, that's been absolutely fascinating. I think, um, you know, I don't. Th- I think a lot of people don't understand what fund managers do. You know, they pass their money across to insurance companies, or you know, and it's a bit of a dark art. It's a bit of a, you know, how do they choose which ones to choose? How do the advisors choose which they want, which funds to choose? You know, it, 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 it's complex. So to get some insight into that, into you know, Dimensional are just one fund manager out of hundreds available, but, you know, one that I've chosen to partner with. And, um, you know, I, I get also that your passion about if you can deliver successful investment experiences to all these advisors who are investing their clients, who are trusting you with their clients' money, 
there's a huge amount of pride which comes from your comments there about the deliverable to the to the greater world that you're doing. So um, I admire you for that philosophy. So thank you so much for, for joining me today. I've really, really loved chatting to you. Thank um, you very much. I'll put some, put some links into Dimensional website, into the show notes. So if people want to find out more about David and the work that he does at Dimensional or about Dimensional and their uh, philosophy, um, you can find out more. So bringing to an end, that's the, uh, the, the Retirement Cafe podcast. I hope you've enjoyed the episode. If you um, want to ask me any questions or let me know what you think, you can contact me on jk at mfpwealthmanagement.co.uk or on Twitter at Justin King CFP. Please tell your friends, leave a review so more people can, uh, like you can find us. So until next time, this is Justin King helping you feel more informed in your retirement. Thank you for listening to the Retirement Cafe podcast with Justin King. To find out more, you can find us online at theretirementcafe.co.uk.